Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. I said praise the Lord. We're in church. Amen. Would you stand this morning as we honor the reading of God's word? And in your copy of God's word, would you turn with me to Acts 28, the book of Acts 28, we're reading verses 1 through 6 this morning. While you are turning there, allow me to commend our church family. I love that. I love that phrase, church family. Not just a church organization, a family. During these past few weeks that so many have been sick, this has, you have really been a family. I want to commend you for you reaching out with phone calls. I want to commend you for you reaching out with texts. Not just to us, but to each other. I want to commend you for networking through social media. I, I do like social media in that sense. Um, building relationships. I, I want to commend you for uh, asking, how, well, how is Sister such and such? I haven't seen her in church and, and us letting you know. I want to commend you for being a church family. Give yourselves a hand. Come on. You could give yourselves, you could, online, come on. You could give yourselves a hand for being a church family. And I want to continue to, I want to encourage you to do that. Some of you are getting, some of you haven't met each other because you're, I started attending the church this past year and you haven't really been able to socialize because we, we limit that because of, of COVID and so forth. And it's kind of hard to know how we look like wearing masks. I'm not sure some of you will recognize each other without masks. I think when, we, when this thing is over, we're going to have to do a picture uh, directory. We're working on that so you can see how people look like from the nose down. Can someone say amen? amen? But I tell you what, I encourage you, those of you that do social media and you connect with someone, say, hey, listen, let me elbow bump you at the, after church as we go to the parking lot. I want to get to know you. Oh, I see you have a little girl that's the same age as my little girl. Let's, 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 let's hook up. Let, let's, let's, let's see. Uh, let's, let, let's do a play date at Jarito Mexican Restaurant or something like that. I, 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 I want you to uh, let the Holy Spirit give you creativity and how to remain as a family. So those of you that are part of family families, you do. Isn't it amazing how creative you get to stay in touch? Isn't it um, how amazing uh, God gives you, gives you the ability to stay in touch with family members out of town, in town, uh, stay healthy, stay safe, but creativity because you want to be with each other. And I, I just want you to let the Holy Spirit give you creativity and not just wait for the day that we could take our mask and linger for, two, linger for two hours in the lobby, but work around it. Amen. We are a church family and continue to pray for each other and continue to care for each other. If you're, if you're wondering, I haven't seen such and such, such and such, you could contact the church office. Now, we cannot give phone numbers out. What we do, just to let you know, uh, if someone asks us and calls and says, oh, can I have the phone number for uh, uh, Brother James Hollebeck? I, you know, I want to call him. What we do, we don't give it to you. What we do, we'll contact Brother James and say, such and such, we'll like your phone number and get permission. Just want to let you know that we kind of protect each uh, privacy, but uh, that's how we do that. But you're welcome to do that. Send an email. Hey, Pastor Cortez or Sister Sharon at the office, can you give me the email of the sister that uh, has three kids and 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 you describe well, she'll, she'll figure it out amen but i want to make sure that we stay as the church family during this time can someone say amen amen that's just me being a pastor acts chapter 28 verses 1 through 6 if you have a say amen, amen. now when they had escaped then they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain 
there was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt, this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. I want to have you look back at verse 5. I'm going to read that again. But he shook, Paul shook off the creature, the viper, into the fire and suffered no harm. This morning, the Lord has laid in my heart a sermon entitled, The Snake Bite That Glorified God. The Snake Bite That Glorified God. This has been churning in my spirit all week. And I realize the Spirit of God has prompted me to preach a message for our church family. Online and in person. Other people may be blessed by it, but this message is for family life, assembly of God, church family. This is for you. Online, this is for you. So pay attention, take heed to the word of God. Could we pray? Father, right now I pray that your word will be presented accurately, that you may anoint your servant this morning, strengthen your servant to preach and deliver your word for our church family on this Sunday morning in January. I pray that our hearts will be receptive to your word. I pray right now that any distractions, any thoughts, anything that may pull us away from giving you 100% attention, Lord, I speak against it right now. Lord, I pray right now that if anyone here is in pain, right now in pain, physical pain, Lord, we don't have to wait for a healing line. I pray right now, Lord, touch them right now. Heal them right now. Deliver them from the pain right now. We sent the word in Jesus' name. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. I know that many preachers have probably preached this passage about the viper biting the hand of uh, Paul because it's a good, it's an incredible word picture. But one thing I, the Lord led me to do, and I often do, is when I preach something, I like to preach it in context. I like to review what happened before. And maybe what happened afterwards so that the scripture has more meaning. It makes more sense. So to do that this morning, I want to give you some background information. Paul the Apostle for years had always wanted to go to Rome. He hadn't been to Rome. Pardon, pardon one minute. He had never been to Rome. In all his trips, nada. But the reason he wanted to go to Rome was because he had heard that Rome had a thriving church that he didn't start. No one really knows who started the church in Rome. And most scholars speculate that there were Jews that had traveled from Rome 
to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost because when you read that passage, it says that Jews from Rome were there. And during the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came down and people turned their hearts to the Lord and were filled with the Holy Spirit, many of those Jews that had traveled from all over the region to, to attend the Pentecost, the feast, went back to their homes, including these Jews from Rome. Went there and took the gospel. So there was a thriving church in Rome. Paul wanted to go, never had the opportunity now. In chapter 27, we see Rome, we see uh, Paul was now on a ship as a prisoner being sent to Rome to face a Caesar. He had gone through several trials there in the in Jerusalem region. And because uh, he kept on uh, challenging the court system, and he kept on saying, listen, you can't treat me that way. I am a Jew, yes, but I am a citizen of Rome. So as a result of that, they kicked it up. The court case kicked it up to the Supreme Court and said, okay, we're, we'll deal with you later. We'll, we'll send you to Rome. And Paul said, goody, goody, goody. I've always wanted to go to Rome. And I get to go to Rome at your company expense. In fact, they say, when you read the scripture, it says, you know what? Had you not, had you not mentioned uh, that you were a Roman citizen, we would have dropped the case. But because you mentioned Rome and you mentioned that you are a Roman citizen, we're, we're going to ship you to Caesar. And then Paul said, you know, that's exactly the plan. I want you to send me to Rome. That's an expensive trip. I want you to send me to Rome on company expense. So he's now on a ship being sent to Rome. One ship, then they switch to another ship. And we know that eventually he did make it to Rome. And he spent two years in house arrest in Rome. House arrest, the first time he was there, uh, it meant that he was able to leave and come and go, have people come and go and visit him. It was not that bad. And while he was in house arrest in Rome, uh, uh, he was able to encourage the Roman believers of the church there. In fact, during those two years, he wrote four of the many epistles or letters. And he wrote them there, so it was a very productive season of his life. But now we, 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 we see him in a ship. And the ship is, is sending him to Rome, but the ship is in danger. The ship is facing a deadly storm that is brewing ahead. And we read in Acts chapter 27, verses 8 through 11, he says, Luke, who wrote Acts and was traveling with Paul, says, passing it with difficulty, that pit stop they made, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Now when much time had been spent, meaning they were waiting for the change of winds, and sailing was now dangerous, because of the fast was already over, meaning the day of atonement. Uh, ships did not travel uh, mid-September or until mid-November. And that deadline went. And they were traveling when ships didn't travel. Verse, continuing verse 10. Paul advised them, verse 9, verse 10, saying, Men, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Paul spoke up. You see, Paul was a seasoned world traveler. He had traveled a lot, and he knew when something didn't feel right. He knew when something was ugly, and he knew that ships should not travel after the fast, after the Day of Atonement. He knew that was a dangerous, risky decision. And remember this, you may not know this, but Paul had survived three prior shipwrecks. He was a shipwreck survivor three times, so he knew what uh, the potential of a shipwreck looked like. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded 
by the helmsman and the owner of the ship that by the things spoken by Paul. Uh, you see, sometimes people make, it, make decisions based upon popular opinion and economics. And sometimes they'll say, I prayed about it, but it looks good. And they take a survey and they make the dumbest decision based upon money and popularity. This is what was happening here. So this ship continued on this, on this dangerous journey. And the Bible tells us that this ship was slammed by a ferocious storm, and fear gripped the hearts of everyone. 276 people, the Bible says, were on the ship. And such, such storms, such a, a, a horrible storm, vicious storm, uh, it was that they began to wrap cables underneath and around the ship so that it did not come apart, and they began to overthrow overboard the extra weight. And the Bible says that neither moon or stars, they saw neither moon nor stars for many days. It was, can you imagine just a blackout day and night, day and night? I don't know about you, but I like to have some sunlight. That when, when the days are dark and cloudy, I, I don't like it. It affects my spirit. I remember we used to live in a tenement building in the South Bronx. And for several years, and the Hallelujah building that many of you heard about, but one thing I didn't like about it, it was a railroad apartment, and my room faced, the window faced a brick wall. So my room was dark during the day, dark in the afternoon, dark at nighttime, dark, dark at nighttime. And now it's there, it, it, it did something to you, so now we like sunlight. My wife and I, we like sunlight. We like to open up windows. We like to, we, even in dark days, we put the lights on uh, because there's something about just things that are dark and spooky and, 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 and just oppressive. And they were, they didn't see uh, anything for several days, for many days, nor stars, nor moon. And the Bible says all hope was gone that we should be saved. They came to a place that they realized, you know, we're going to die. We are going to die. And everyone began to plan uh, plan uh, their sea burial. They began to plan to say goodbye to each other. All hope was gone. And then suddenly the Bible says, Paul got up and made an announcement. He told the 275 other people, hey, folks, gather around. I have an announcement. And we read in Psalms 27, verses 21 to 25, we read uh, that Paul says, verse 21, but after lo a long abstinence from food, they weren't fasting, they were nauseous. They couldn't keep food in their, in their stomach. But after a long abstinence, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve. I like that phrase, to whom I belong and whom I serve. It means I, I live for Christ and I, I live for Christ and I live with Christ. Two, that's two separate things. I live for Christ and I live with Christ. An angel of the Lord came up to me. Let me stop there. This was not the first time that an angel of God would show up. Uh, show up and speak to Paul. Uh, this past Wednesday during my Bible study, we talk about the book of Acts uh, in chapter 18 when Paul was in this crazy city called Corinth. Corinth was a demonic city. It was a city, imagine the worst of New York City combined with the worst of New Orleans and combined with the worst of Las Vegas. That was Corinth where they served the love goddess, the goddess of Venus that had a temple on a, on a tall mountain. And every day, 1,000 priestess from the temple would come down, and they were prostitutes that would come down to, to work their trade. And the place was filled with immorality and vice. 
And during that time, Paul felt alone and felt like I have no one else here. And he was full of fear. And suddenly, uh, an angel of God showed up to Paul. And the angel of God said, fear not. Fear not. Because he was fearful. And you're not alone. For I have many people in the city. And that's Paul. Paul just needed to know I'm not the only one. There's people of kindred spirit here. And God brought to him people. So this was not the first time that God spoke to Paul by sending an angel. He sent an angel again. And he says in verse 23, For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve. And the angel said, Do not be afraid. Same thing as he did in Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 18, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid. God is telling someone here today, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Note, God is not speaking about there's healthy fear and there's crazy fear. I have a fear of heights. That's not demonic. I don't like heights. I have, I have a fear of eating un, undercooked chicken. That's not demonic. I've been there. I know what it is. So I have a healthy fear of certain things. I have a fear sometimes when I come down Westheimer, come to Family Life Assembly of God, and come south on Westheimer, and I have to turn left to go to Rosner. I have a fear of being hit by cars. And I'm there waiting for people, and then, and then people coming up, rustling the other way. I don't know what they're doing. And I have a fear of getting hit by a car with no insurance. <laughs> and by the way, I, we read a few months ago that the city, uh, the city or the Katy area is installing a light there on, on Rosner and Westheim. And praise the Lord, somebody. I'm happy for that. <laughs> but I'm not talking about a concern or an apprehension type of fear. I'm talking about a fear that paralyzes you. I'm talking about a fear that controls you. I'm talking about a fear that is killing you. See, the Bible says that the Bible says that you need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. But when fear controls you, then suddenly you're not being controlled by the Holy Spirit. You're being controlled by fear. Fear that becomes, that, bec that, is, uh, that is, is the glove that Satan puts his hand in and manipulates you. Do not fear, he says in verse 24. In other words, he's telling Paul, don't allow fear to paralyze you, Paul. Don't allow fear to prompt you to make faithless reactionary decisions. Don't allow fear to cause you to begin digging your own grave. Don't allow fear to paralyze you. Don't allow fear uh, to, to control you because this type of fear is not from me. This type of fear comes from the pit of hell. For fear hath torment, but perfect love casts out all fear. Somebody praise the Lord this morning. And it's interesting that after this moment, I'll stop there. After this moment, that God sent an angel, and the angel tells uh, Paul, don't let that type of demonic fear control you. Don't let that type of demonic fear manipulate you and paralyze you and begin to bury you. Don't do that. You have an assignment. It is interesting, I find, that Paul, fast forward years later, He's writing to a young Timothy, and young Timothy is pastoring a church, and young Timothy is pastoring the, the church in, in Ephesus, and young Timothy is being um, paralyzed with fear. And Paul gives him advice that he learned from the Lord, and he tells this young Timothy, Timothy, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Stir yourself up. Shake that thing off. Stir up the gift of God. For God has not given you a spirit of fear. This was a man. They learned something here at this boat. Timothy, fast forward. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. 
Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost love, and Holy Ghost sound mind. Hallelujah. Why was Paul able to give advice like that to Timothy? Because in this boat, in this storm, he was about to bury himself. He, was, he himself was overwhelmed by fear. And that's what the angel said to him in verse 24. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. In other words, Paul, don't be afraid. I, God has sent you to go to Rome. You have an assignment to go to Rome. You have an assignment to go there and spend two years encouraging the church in Rome and writing four epistles. So even though it looks like you're not going to make it, and even though the fear is overwhelming you, I'm here to remind you that God's promise is sure. God said, you are going to Rome. And Paul, you are going to Rome. Don't let fear stop you. Don't let fear bury you prematurely. You are going to Rome. And indeed, God has granted you, verse 24, and indeed, God has granted you, all those who sail with you. Not only are you going to Rome, but I'm going to throw a bonus blessing the 275 additional people on the boat, not one is going to drown. Not one is going to die. Why? Because you are with them. You're walking in an anointing. And they're going to be blessed because of you. They don't know it right now, but they're going to be blessed by you. Hallelujah. Someone embrace the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After this announcement, we find out that after 14 days of sailing, the ship crashed. There was a shipwreck. It crashed on an island of Malta at the end of 14 days. And the Bible says that just before it crashed, the centurion commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest of the people, some on boards and some on parts of the ship and broken pieces of the ship, would also make it to Malta. And so it was, the Bible says, all escaped safety to the land. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that because Paul, uh, a trusted God, uh, God did a miracle. Let me go. You know what? I, 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 I need to go back and to turn back, Mr. Soundman, to Acts 27, verse 21 and 25. Let me read verse 24 again, saying, the angel saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar and Rome. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with me. Oh, this is, the main, this is the main verse, verse 25. I have this underlying highlighted in my Bible. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, he's telling the 275 panicky people in the boat. Therefore, take heart. For I believe God. For I believe God that it would be just as it was told to me. In other words, he was saying, I know it looks bad. I know the storm looks ferocious. I know that the ship is falling apart. And I know that you veteran seagoing sailors are panicking. And many of you are riding your will. You're ready to be buried in sea. And you're ready burying me. But I heard from the Lord. I heard a word from God. And God reminded me, you're not going to die. God reminded me, you are going to Rome. I am sending you Rome. It doesn't look good, but you will make it to Rome. And you know what, folks? You may not agree with me, and you may not think, you may think I'm crazy, but I believe God. I believe God. 
I don't believe the news. I don't believe the press. I don't believe people's opinions. But I believe God. He was saying, I have faith in God. I have faith in God. In God, and I'm not going to let the devil play with my faith in God. God gave me a word, and I'm going to hold on to his word. I believe God. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. You see, folks, your faith is what the enemy wants to play with. Your faith is what the enemy wants to manipulate. Your faith is what the enemy wants to explode That's why in Jude 3, Jude says, content for the faith. Fight for the faith. Not just being faithful, but the faith in God. If the enemy can get you to disown God, if the enemy can get you to lose your faith in God, he's won. You may not die, but you're walking like a zombie. He wants to attack and hurt and destroy your faith. He almost did here on this boat. He almost did. The angels told the angels told uh, Paul, "Fear not, because he was fearful." And the angels said, "You're gonna make it to Rome." And faith arose. And Paul told everyone that ship, "I believe God." Some of you need to practice saying that phrase. Some of you need to practice saying that phrase to yourself. You go home, look in the mirror and say, I believe God. I believe God. You believe what? He who hath performed a good work in you shall complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I believe God. Believe what? No weapons formed against you shall prosper. I believe God. Believe what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. I believe God. Somebody get happy. Somebody praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The ship crashed. The ship crashed. But exactly what God said what occur, occurred. Not one of the people died as the ship crashed in the island of Malta. Now, they're at, I had to, that was all background to get you to the passage that I opened up with. Now they have crashed in the island of Malta. 276 people. They're water soaked. They're freezing. Yeah, I think one of the worst miserable feelings is when you're walking in freezing rain. I don't mind snow, but wet, cold rain when the temperature is like 25 and it's raining. And it's like the rain is a kind of icy rainy. And you get some of you getting cold, that's what I'm talking, telling you about. And it soaks into it soaks into your bones. You know, I, I'd rather have snow than wet, cold, freezing rain. The Bible says, it tells us that they were water soaked, they were freezing, half drowned, exhausted, bruised, and miserable. They were banged up. They had survived a shipwreck. And they landed on this island called Malta. The Bible says natives. Uh, and the word natives means, uh, means uh, I know King James says barbarians, but they weren't crazy. It really means natives. And natives by that means they didn't speak Greek or Latin. And they had zero knowledge of the almighty God. But these natives were extremely hospitable to the 276 people. And they uh, created not just a fire. It was, it was a bonfire. You need a big bonfire to warm up. Freezing cold, 276 people. And they did this big, big bonfire. And Paul wanted to help. So Paul began to pick up a bundle of sticks. And then he didn't know that in the bundle that he had, there was a viper in the bundle. And when he threw the bundle of sticks in the fire, the viper jumped out of the fire and bit him. And was hanging on his hand. 
And the natives were alarmed, thinking, oh, he must really be a criminal. That must be justice from, uh, from, from an almighty, from a God, uh, the God that they serve. He must be a criminal. And that viper bit. This is after surviving 14 day, a 14-day quarantine. Can somebody say Amen. A 14-day quarantine. Online people, a 14-day quarantine, a 14-day storm, and a shipwreck, and being banged up, and freezing. You will think it should be getting better. But the enemy comes with one more attack, one more bite, and he bit him. But Paul understood this. He understood that this was an attack from hell. He understood that Satan was attacking his, I believe God. Yeah, the devil was attacking his, I believe God. You believe God now? You know, I'll bite you. No, I still believe God. The devil was attacking his faith. The devil was trying to inject a, his venom of fear. His venom of fear. After this vicious storm, after a 14-day quarantine, after Paul lost all his belongings because they were thrown overboard. But you see, folks, Paul was, had absolute faith in God. He had absolute faith in God's promise. He had absolute faith in God's word that he would see Rome he knew. He said, I don't know what, how it's going to happen, Lord. And this, this venomous snake has bit me. But you told me that I'm going to make it to Rome. In other words, God, I've had this child that I raised in church. I have this child that you promised is going to serve you. You have given me vision of this child living for you. And this child, I don't recognize him anymore. I don't recognize her anymore. They're living for the devil. And everyone has given up. But Lord, you gave me a word. You gave me a promise. And I'm not going to let this stake throw me off. I believe God. I said, I believe God. So Paul, because of his absolute faith in God, the Bible says he shook that snake into the fire. Oh, as I read that, the Lord gave me a vision. He just didn't shake it. He took that snake and he said, calmly, very calmly, and all the natives spooked, spookified. He took that snake and he goes, I believe God. I believe God. You got to check it off when the enemy comes and attacks you and tries to bring fear into you. You have to say, I believe God. You go back to the pit of hell where you came from. I believe God. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. I believe God. Faith in God. And faith in God's promise. I thank God that I was raised in a little church filled with people that believe God. I was raised by a godly grandmother that believed God. My grandmother got saved later on. She had been, for those who are from Puerto Rican descent, you appreciate this. My grandmother was a spiritista. She was a witch in the island of Puerto Rico. She was a witch in the town of Lares, Puerto Rico. And she was a person that people used a lot. But she got gloriously saved and became a woman of God. Moved to New York City and led many people to the Lord. I was fortunate that during a difficult time, she took me in and she raised me. And I was a basket case. 
And you know what I learned from watching her life? I learned that she believed God. She had a faith in God, and nothing can sway her way. And people wanted to be near her because of her faith in God. She would pray three hours a day, an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, an hour in the evening, on her knees with her big Godzilla Bible. And most of the time she would moan and groan and ask God for a miracle. And she would pray for me, that God would just heal me and call me and, call me and use me. So I, I, I respect that there's two, there's two incidents that happened, memory, then I look back, I realize this was a woman of God. She knew, how to, she knew how to shake that viper into the fire. The first incident, I was sharing this with my wife. I must have been, I don't know, nine or something, and, and she lived in the projects in the South Bronx, and there were a few other witches that lived there, and, she knew, and they knew that my grandmother was an ex-witch. And they're always trying to put hexes on her, and nothing ever happened. But one time we came home from church, and we came to her apartment at 5, 520 East, 137th Street in the South Bronx near Brook Avenue. And we went there, and we got to her apartment, and there in front of, of, of the door, there was white powder. She recognized it because she realized that, that the witches were trying to put a hex on her. And, and, she, and, and I said, Grandma, what's that? And I was going to kick it away with my foot. She said, don't touch it. Don't touch it with your foot. A witch is trying to put a hex. And, and I don't know where you are spiritually, so don't, don't, don't touch it. And then I'm thinking, okay, so this, let's just jump over it. But instead of jumping over it, she pushed me aside. And then she took her foot and she did what she told me not to do. She took her foot and she swept it with her foot, speaking in tongues. And, I, and you, know, you know what? I think she was saying, I believe God. I believe God. And that impacted me. That impacted me because I saw her faith in God. Her faith in God. She knew that no weapon formed against her would prosper. The other incident that the Lord reminded me yesterday as I was in prayer is, again, I, and I've shared with you the story. When I was nine years old, my mother tried to commit suicide, and I'm the one that found her and found her traumatized me. And uh, we were there. Some of the neighbors came, and she was unconscious. She had, take, she had swallowed all the pills in the house, and, and I was just freaking out. And then... We called 911, and before the ambulance arrived, it took a while for them to get there. And I really thought my mother was dead. And I'm crying to God. I said, God, my dad died when I was a month old, and now you're taking my mother. I'm going to be an orphan. She married someone, a minister who was my stepfather, but he had no relationship with me. So in my mind, I was going to be an orphan. And then I, and I was just full of, I was, I, I was, I, it was shipwreck. I was, I was planning my death at the age of nine. And suddenly my grandmother shows up and the Holy Spirit had told her, go over to the house. She lived two blocks away and she ran over two blocks and she arrived to the, to the house, to the apartment. And she saw my mother look dead and she saw me crying. She saw my brother crying and a few neighbors. And she went in there in faith. She didn't cry. She didn't panic. She went in there. And in her Bible, before she left the house, she brought her Goya olive oil. <laughs> and some of you wonder why I'm into that brand. Because I identified that Goya olive oil with my grandmother. She, had, she brought the entire bottle of Goya olive oil. She had it in her big purse. She went to my, grand, my mother. She tilted her head back. She took the olive oil and she poured that olive oil down my mother's throat while speaking in tongues. She was saying, Lord, I'm not going to let you take her. Lord, there's still a purpose in in her life. Lord, she needs to raise these kids. She needs to be back in church. She needs to get it together. She, and, 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 and Apertito, she come in. She, he needs to see that you are a God. I believe God. She poured that oil. And then within moments, my mother, she began to convulse and she began to vomit all the pills. I remember seeing hundreds of white pills coming out of her mouth. And you may say, oh, disgusting. But for me, it was like, she's alive. And by the time the ambulance people came, my mother's stomach had been pumped by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm here to remind you, folks. I'm here to remind you that what God can, when God has promised something to you, he will perform it. He will perform it. But your responsibility is to believe God. Don't ask me to give you my faith. You have to get your own faith to believe God. You have to look in the mirror, take his word, read his word, and say, I believe God. And when the enemy comes and attacks you with fear, attacks you with his venom of fear and doubt, you need to take that hand and say, I believe God. 
I believe God, right now, some of right now, I know this may sound crazy, but you're saying, Lord, you're speaking to me. And there's a fear that the enemy has been trying to inject in you right now. To go do it with me. Take the hand and say, I believe God. Come on. I believe God. Hallelujah. Give him praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor, so Pastor, how are you doing? You had COVID and, and you're, you're bouncing back. I promise you after this, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> I'm, we're managing it. Pastor, how are you doing? Some of the people haven't come back to church. How are you doing? Are you worried? No. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you something. I believe God. I believe God for an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival for this. That's what we need. We need revival. I believe God for a great harvest this year. I believe God that we will become more of a Pentecostal witness here in the Katy area. And that we'll be not just eliminate missionaries, but add missionaries. I believe God. I believe God that there will be more deliverances and healings in this church. I believe God that our church will become more of a 911 church. Do you know that our address, do you know that our address in Rosner is 24911? 24911, 24 hours a day. You could call 911, you could call on the Lord. Psalms 91 1. Hallelujah. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him would I trust. 24911. When people ask you for the address, you should know the address. 24 hours a day, 911. Hallelujah. I believe God. This week, as I was praying, I was thinking about this song. Some of you old saints, you may know it. I'm going through, yes, I'm going through. I'll pay the price, whatever others do. I'll take this way with my Lord's chosen few. I started in Jesus and I'm going through. Pastor, are you okay? Pastor, are you okay? Uh, are you, do you need water? Are you okay? Are you worried? You're not going to quit on me. No, 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 no. I'm going through. Yes, I'm going through. I'll pay the price, whatever others do. I'll take this way with my Lord's chosen few. I started in Jesus, and I'm going through. Stand, somebody. Come on, stand. I'm going through, yes. I'm going through. I'll pay the price, whatever others do. I'll take this way with my Lord's chosen few. I started in Jesus, and I'm going through. How many of you knew that song? Uh, let me say this, would you come? We're not going to sing that because you haven't rehearsed it. Sister Angie. It's good to see you there with the sling. We we'll appreciate and your son, your both, your whole survived COVID, right? And and Jared, I saw you playing cymbals at the Katy High School State Championship in Irving. My wife and I were watching the game, and you and your mom sent you a picture, and you were there playing the cymbals. Oh, one of us is there. Thank you, Jesus. Katy High School. Hallelujah. But I mentioned because Sister Angie, uh, she's just very talented. I, I, I could sing anything. I could sing any song. I could create a key. And she, and she finds it. Or she helps me find the right key. 
Amen. And she's recovering from a, a shoulder surgery. So she hasn't been playing for a while. I'm looking forward for you to get back on the piano. Amen. I'm closing. Satan, when he attacks believers, listen carefully. He's not trying, when he attacks you, he's not necessarily attacking your wallet, even though he does attack finances. He's not necessarily attacking your uh, health, even though he, touched, he attacks health. He's not necessarily attacking uh, the peace around you, whatever it is. You know what he's attacking? He's attacking your faith. Or he's attacking your, quote, I believe God. See, when you say, I believe God, you're saying faith. He's attacking your, quote, I believe God. He knows that if you get discouraged, he knows if you give up, he knows that if he can destroy your faith, he's got you. He'll give you house, he'll give you lands, he'll, he'll finance you if he knows you have no faith. Oh, I have faith in me. I have faith in my investment. I have, I have faith in my friends. I have faith in, in, in whatever it is. If he could get you to eliminate your faith and destroy your faith, he's got you. That's why Jude 3 says content for the faith. He, and he attacks us, listen carefully, when you are already tired. When you are vulnerable and hurting, he attacks you. He'll bite you. He'll bite you after your 14 days. He waits, he, he waits until you're tired. Oh, man, it's been rough Christmas, and I was quarantined, got sick, and it's been 14 days, but now it's been after that. I'm still, <coughs> I still have my cough, and it's hard. We're praying by the way this morning for Pastor Russell and Joanne, who's who's. They've been past the COVID, but they're still recovering. And brother, Pastor Russell, we love you, Sister Joanna. We know you're watching. And you emailed me last night. You wanted to come to church. I said, no, stay home. Watch online. And I can feel your amens right through the screen. <laughs> Amen. And by the way, uh, and I don't, I, I don't want to miss everybody. There's all kinds of people watching. James, you're here. But Tiffany, I'm sure you're watching online. And, and I, I see as a family here. But Alfred Castillo, your family's here. They came to church. Alfred Castillo is recovering from emergency surgery on his hand, by the way. Amen. And Alfred, I, I think when you were watching this, I could feel you sick, saying, I believe God with that hand. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But you see, folks, the enemy wants to attack your faith. He attacks your faith when you're tired, vulnerable, and hurting. He attacks your faith when you think the worst is over. All oh, right. September, October, these are wonderful. COVID's picking up. And then December, I mean, we get slammed. Katie gets slammed. We thought this was over. He attacks when you think the worst is over. And he attacks when you're trying to make a comeback. And he attacks when you're gathering sticks. When you're not expecting him, that's when he attacks. That is when we must declare to ourselves and declare to heaven and earth and under the earth, I believe God while shaking the viper. Let me tell you something. When the devil bites you, you must respond with a fight. He bites, you fight. He bites you fight. He bites. You fight. How do you fight? I believe God. I love Job in the Bible. Though we get worse and we go from ugly to uglier and the flesh falls from my bone and it looks hopeless. I know my Redeemer liveth. That is faith. Every head bow, every eye close. Here online to your online, you're in church. Has the enemy, has the viper tried to attack your faith? 
has the viper tried to infuse you with his venom of fear? I want to encourage you under the anointing of the Holy Spirit for you to proclaim the statement and declare, I choose to believe God. I choose to see the fingerprints of God. I want to do this. It's one of those, I don't want the pandemic to manage me. I want to manage the pandemic. But those of you that you would like me to pray for you, I'm going to invite you to come to the front. If you come to the front, wear your mask, be with your family, but space out. I'm going to keep you long. But for me, it's just, I don't want to let the enemy control this. And some of you, you may want to remain in your seats. I get it. But you're saying, first of all, you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. The enemy has tried to bite me and infuse me with venom, with fear. And I need my I believe God back in action. Would you raise your hand quickly? I know there's more of you. Come on. Amen. Put your hands down. Before I dismiss you, I want to pray for you. If you feel comfortable, would you come to the front, wear your mask? I want to pray. I'll, I'll stay here, but I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. There's something about the altar. Coming to the altar. Something about the altar. Amen. Just space out. If you came with family, you could be stay with family. Wherever you see it with, you could be with. Amen. Hallelujah. This is good. We can make a second row. Just come towards the middle if, they, if we need to do a second row. Hallelujah. 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 Before I pray, let me read one more scripture. And this is for everybody here online too. Jesus said in Luke chapter 1, verse 8, we don't have a PowerPoint for this, but listen to this. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, when, he, when the Lord comes in the second coming, will he find faith? Will he find faith? Will he find faith on the earth? When the Lord comes to take his church, he's looking for a church full of faith. Will he come and find faith? That's why you need to protect that faith. Guard your faith. Nurture that faith. Nurture the I believe God. He's coming for a church that has faith, a church filled with, I believe God. Let's bow our heads. Father, this message you have burned in my heart all week. Lord, I've been praying, Lord. I've been praying, Lord, give me messages that are relevant. Give me words from you, oh God. Lord, we need more than just inspirational speeches we need a word from you and I pray right now that those here and watching online may realize this was a word not from Pastor Cortez this was a word from God through his messenger Lord I believe Lord I, I believe you I believe God and Father I pray that each and every person standing here in the front Lord their faith that has been battered their faith that has been bruised, their faith that has experienced shipwreck, their faith that has experienced a cold drenching, their faith that has experienced viper bites. Father, I pray that we may activate our faith, exercise our faith, and shake it off into the fire while proclaiming to ourselves, not just to other people, to ourselves, I believe God. I choose to believe God. The majority vote is give up on God, but I choose to believe God. I pray for every person here, Lord. Every person, Lord. 
Lord, every person, you know their story. You know the story. Lord, every story. Lord, family issues, issues with children, issues with jobs, family issues. Lord, I pray for this family here, Lord. Lord, standing here, Lord, we pray for that young lady, the relative, the daughter in Long Island, Lord, that experience is an attack. Lord, we can't always get on an airplane and go there, but we send the word. We send the word. Why? We believe God. We believe his promise. Lord, you have given promises to many people here. Promises. Rome, you're going to make it to Rome. You're going to, you will do such and such. You will be used mightily in such and such. Your child will be living for you. Your ch for, for the Lord. Your child will be, uh, has a calling upon their lives. Lord, it doesn't look good, but I believe God. I believe your word. And Lord, I pray that we may embrace the advice that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. Stir up. Stir it up. Check yourself. Stir up. Stir up the gift of God which is in you. For God has not given you a spirit of fear. God has not given you a spirit or torment. God has not given you a spirit that paralyzes you. But God has given you the, a Holy Spirit of power, a Holy Spirit of love, and a Holy Spirit of a sound mind. You're not going to go crazy. Someone here, I'm here to tell you, you're not going to go crazy. The enemy's trying to tell you you're going crazy. You're not going to go crazy. The Holy Spirit will give you a sound mind. A you're not going to go crazy. I don't know who I'm speaking to. You're not going to go crazy. But you need to go on a, on, on, you need to go on a, on a diet, not physical diet, on a word diet. Stop watching Fox News. Stop watching CNN. Fill your spirit with the word of God. Holy Spirit, I know you're moving among us today. I sense it. I sense it. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you that you're not restricted with social distancing. You're not, rest you're, you're not restricted with masks. You cannot be con manipulated, controlled by the, by the right wing or the left wing. Antifa cannot control you. And the Proud Boys cannot control you. What you do among us is determined by our faith and obedience to you, not who's in the White House. Lord, sometimes we put more hope in the White House than in God's house. We come to God's house. We trust you. Jesus, you're the man. Every four years, we may have someone else in the White House, but we don't worship the White House or who's in the Oval Office, regardless of the political party. We're kingdom people. We're kingdom people. We're wired differently. We have the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will just strengthen each person here. Lord, I pray that as they get into the parking lot, as they get inside the car, they may shake their hands. Shake their hands. I believe God. And after the shipwreck, when the enemy comes again, I believe God. And when the enemy brazenly tries to attack us yet one more time, I believe God. Lord, thank you for a church that believes God. I pray for each person in our church, everyone watching online. Lord, I pray for the souls that you will bring to the kingdom, the harvest. You're going to use this church for greater harvest. I give you thanks in advance. Why? Because I believe God. We, family life, we believe God. I pray a blessing upon each person here today. At the altar, in their seats, in our Spanish language church, Casa de Vida. 
in our children's ministry. Every person online watching now or later on during our repeat live stream. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen and amen. God bless you. Love one another. Stay in touch. Use social media. God bless you.